and I have the science to say what you should do, but it's up to you to, do, to determine whether or not you want to do that. The body will turn on the tumor and dissolve it and eat it together with the diet drug combination. Professor Seafried, it's great to have you back on the show. We're going to get further into alternative cancer treatments. You have a lot to share in that realm. And after our first interview went live, it exploded on YouTube and people are are really receiving that well. So I'm excited to get into more of the nuances, what you have you know, done in your research and what you can share with us. But I think a good starting off place before we get into treatments and, and that whole ball of wax again is talking about what happens to a regular cell in the body when it becomes cancerous. Let's talk about the physiology and set things up that way. Well, thank you very much, Jesse. And it's it's nice to have a return visit, if you will. Um, yeah, so, I mean, the definition uh, of cancer, and I may have mentioned this before, um, is cell division out of control. So what happens to the uh, first or group of cells that become dysregulated in their growth? Because ultimately, this is what the problem is. You have most of the cells in our body are in what we call a differentiated state, a quiescent state. They're all arranged in order in our various organs and tissues, and they all contribute together uh, to the society of cells in the body, which ultimately is us, uh, whether it's in the brain, the liver, um, you know, you have liver dysfunction and your, your brain responds in a way the brain would have a problem. The liver would respond in a way. All of our, all of our systems are integrated, uh, through blood networks, through immune systems. So we, we are actually a very highly tuned integrated machine. What happens though, um, to a cell uh, in, say, a breast or a bladder or a colon or, or uh, you know, lung, that would make that cell uh, become dysregulated in its growth. So, um, well, there's been a, a lot of ways that cancer has been produced in cells and tissues of our body, and most of it has to do with a chronic disruption of the, of the cellular microenvironment. Um, through uh, irritation, uh, through a viral infection, uh, through a blocked a blood vessel that would cause a chronic or restricted uh, a hypoxic environment. Um, the, the problem is, is that that, and it's, I say chronic, because most acute damages to cells and tissues uh, will lead to rapid death. And uh, as Otto Warburg said, you can never get a dysregulated cancer cell from a dead cell. So there has to be some level, there has to be some time frame when this uh, regulated cell, this quiescent differentiated cell uh, has an opportunity to become dysregulated. And what, what, what's responsible for the quiescent regulated differentiated state is the function of the energy metabolism within that cell. And that's controlled by the organelle called the mitochondrion. It's kind of a spaghetti network that exists in the cytoplasm of the cell. That network uh, interacts with the nucleus. The nucleus and the mitochondria within a cell have a very uh, intimate uh, communication system from signaling pathways and such like this. Um, but uh, a chronic insult to a cell or a tissue leads to a gradual loss of energy through oxygen. So to prove that, I mean, you're breathing, I'm breathing, most living people, uh, most animal, everything gets energy, they breathe oxygen, get oxygen in, either through the gills, through the lungs or whatever. That oxygen serves as an acceptor, a final electron acceptor for the electron transport chain in the mitochondria that generate large amounts of energy very efficiently. However, if that uh, energy efficiency is chronically interrupted, not to the point where you kill the cell, where because the, if there's no energy uh, death, you, you can't be alive with no energy. So what happens in the cancer process is that the energy is transferred from oxidative phosphorylation, breathing oxygen, to an ancient pathway of what we call fermentation. Um, the technical term is substrate level phosphorylation, a, a type of energy, a type of energy mechanism that existed 
for all living organisms that were on our planet uh, before oxygen came into the atmosphere some 2.5 billion years ago. So these heirlooms of energy metabolism exist in most of the cells of our body, these old ancient heirlooms, but they play a very, very minor role when we're breathing oxygen. They, they have a very low uh, a, a production of energy. If these uh, oxfos, energy through oxidative phosphorylation, is corrupted or deficient or anything like that, the ancient pathways are upregulated. And the mitochondria send a, a message to the nucleus of the cell, and the nucleus of the cell sends out a, a messenger that upregulates transporters for glucose and glutamine, the two fuels that are necessary for these ancient pathways to maintain viability. The problem with that is that that same organelle, the mitochondria, that's responsible for differentiation and quiescence, also controls the cell cycle and the differentiated state. So when that organelle becomes corrupted and the cell falls back on the ancient fermentation pathways, the controller of the cell cycle is not there. And what happens, the cell starts to divide exactly the way it did uh, 2.5 billion years ago, because all of the cells at that time uh, were dysregulated in their growth. They just grew and grew and grew and grew until the fuels, were, uh, uh, fermentable fuels, disappeared in the environment and the cells would die. So this whole cancer thing is not a mystery. These cells are simply falling back, these cancer cells. And when you look at them, in every major tissue of every major cancer, you look at the mitochondrion in the human cells, and you find them defective. You find them few in number, their morphology is abnormal, and their function is abnormal. So if that's all abnormal, and structure determines function, then these cells are dividing and dysregulated because the very organelle that's controlling this process is dysfunctional. And these cells then are growing uh, based on the availability of the sugar glucose and the amino acid glutamine in the microenvironment of those cells. And as long as those two fuels are present in sufficient quantities, those cells will be growing in a dysregulated way, and they become worse and worse and worse until you get the spread, which, which we now know what, what underlies that. That's another story uh, that would require some level of explanation. But we know, um, basically, uh, we, I understand, uh, basically, uh, what causes cancer, how it develops, how it metastasizes, and basically how, how, what we need to do to stop it in a non-toxic way. Dr. Seafried, correct me if I'm wrong, but the way I understand it, we all get cancer at different points throughout our life, but the body typically fights that off and destroys it before it becomes a problem. Is that how you understand it? Is that true? Uh, you know, maybe it is to some extent. I mean, if you don't get cancer, I mean, if what, what are you saying? We all have cancer. Um, uh, I don't know. Maybe, maybe we do. Maybe we don't. I mean, if we don't, if we all have cancer and never get cancer, well, what does that mean? You know, um, uh, the issue here is is that uh, you have if, if the cells, you can have a benign tumor that kind of grows a little. I mean, you got, I can skin things here. I mean, is that cancer? I don't know. I mean, it's a maybe a small dysregulated cell growth to some little thing. As you get older, you get more of these little things all over your body. You can just take some liquid, liquid nitrogen and burn it off, or you can go to the doctor or do something like that. I mean, it's not going to kill you for sure. Um, but if you get a lesion uh, in, in a cell uh, that has the capacity to grow dysregulated, then you, especially in one of your internal organs or a melanoma or a brain tumor or something like this, you, you got a problem. So the answer to your question is, do we all have cancer? I mean, people say that, uh, maybe they do. I'm not really worried about things that aren't going to kill you. Um, so, uh, but, but once those cells lose their growth regulatory properties, which is part of this mitochondria, that's what we do know. And we do know that that dysregulated growth is driven by a fermentation metabolism. And we do know that as long as those fermentable fuels are in the microenvironment, it's going to be hard to kill that cell. Well, why I'm so curious or part of the reason about what I brought up there, the fact that we all have different small quote unquote cancers at different points in our life and the body destroys them and then we're cancer free again. It gets me thinking about the fact, why is the body or the immune system detecting certain cancers and taking care of them, 
versus others. Yeah. I'm just curious on why that divide. Yeah, I, I think, you know, um, uh, there's some people who never get cancer, right? Uh, and uh, our bodies have a surveillance system. You're absolutely correct. Um, but here's the situation. Uh, that Those little growths and things like that are, in fact, uh, detected by our immune system. Um, and there, there, cancer has been described by some uh, well, well knowledgeable people as a wound that does not heal. Um, and uh, we have immune cells that go in. Now I'm coming to the metastasis part of the, the part of the understanding, is that you have a, a small growth of cells, and you say like, well, your immune system should come in and, and take care of them, and in many times it does, and sometimes it doesn't. And what happens is that the body's immune system looks at this growth and uh, they try to uh, manage the, the, the cells. But the cells send off signals that look like a wound. And our body uh, looks at that and then throws out cytokines and growth factors to try to heal the wound. The problem is, is if you have cells that are already slowly growing, those cytokines and growth factors could actually make those cells grow even faster. So the very system in our body that's designed to try to put out the fire is like throwing gasoline on a fire. So if you have these cells, this, the, our immune systems don't recognize, oh, this is cancer, oh, this is a stab wound or a, some kind of a, a contusion or whatever. They are fibroblasts and macrophages can heal that. But when it comes to an incipient cancer, the very program structures, the program, uh, uh, the programs of those cells is in the wrong context because what their context, what they're doing now is inappropriate and can actually foster that, that small growth to become worse. Um, and then there's this fusion hybridization. We, we, we have cells in our body, macrophages, and uh, when they heal wounds and the wound doesn't heal fast enough, the macrophages fuse together and they form these multinucleated giant cells. And we often see them in cancers. And you'd say, oh, wow, look at our immune system is being overwhelmed by all these uh, dysregulated cancer cells. Um, the problem is the mitochondria in the tumor cell is abnormal, leading to a fermentation uh, and a dysregulated growth. So our normal cells see that. And they throw out the growth factors and cytokines, which is like throwing gasoline on this fire, making it even worse. And they think the, these cells are also programmed to fuse and to try to do a better job. It's like a four alarm fire. You get more fire departments in there and they're fusing together all to try to put out this fire. What happens is the cytoplasm of the cancer cell and the immune cell in this fusion process dilutes the normal mitochondria in the immune cell. That cell is the cell that can ent goes through the bloodstream, enters and exit tissues, and in in inhibits the immune system because it is the immune system. That is the cell that is metastatic. That is the cell that spreads all around your body. They call, oh, I got cancer in my liver, it's in my brain, lung all over the place. Those are macrophages. Those are our normal, former, formerly normal cells that have now become corrupted. And they live on the same fuels, glucose and glutamine. And in order to put the fire, in order to kill these cancer cells, whether it's uh, a singular location, a stem cell tumor that grows like crazy but can't spread, and then you have the normal cells come into the stem cell tumor fusing, and then you get spread. And sometimes the spread can happen very early. They got cancer, what we call cancer of unknown primary cup. Uh, a lot of times, oh, I got cancer. It's all over my body. And they can't find the primary tissue. They can't find the primary organ. Cancer of unknown primary. It represents 5 to 7% of cancer deaths. They don't know where it came from. But all the cells in that cup, uh, they're all macro. They're all part of the immune system. Gone awry. So our very cells that are designed to protect us are the very cells that are killing us. So, um, uh, and you need to know the biology of this. And it took me, it took me 30 years to, of constant research on some of the best animal models, the best, and then you just go to the human literature and you see whether or not what I'm saying is corroborated by pathological reports from the human literature. And it all is. So uh, we know precisely. It's just that the field, for whatever reason, they don't either read the literature, they don't understand the literature, or they come in with a mindset that prevents them from recognizing uh, what I just told you. What's becoming really clear early in the conversation here is that 
cancer is us. I think a lot of yeah. times when they think people think about cancer, the lay person, mm. they want to fight cancer, destroy cancer. What you're making clear throughout the first 15, 20 minutes here is the fact that these are our own cells Yeah, that are, are in the first part when you're describing, they're going back to a more primitive form. And then you describe with the metastasis, the fact these macrophages are starting to behave well, they're converting over to cancer cells. So it's our own body yeah. that is is changing. Right. So when we talk about fighting cancer, essentially we're talking about fighting our own body. Are you passionate about the groundbreaking and heroic research of Dr. Thomas Seifert on metabolic therapy and cancer? So are we. That's why we've created something special for you in collaboration with Johnny Rockermeyer, a German book publisher and translator. Introducing our collection of meticulously crafted books that distill the essence of Dr. Seyfried's work. Dive into the science and discoveries. These summary books are your gateway to understanding the intricate world of metabolic ketogenic therapy in a clear, concise, and engaging way. Whether you're new to the subject or a seasoned enthusiast, our books offer insights that can change your life. Ready to explore this transformative knowledge? Visit our website at www.cancerasametabolicdisease.com to get your copy. You can buy the ebook there directly and the paper book via the provided links. Here's the best part. A portion of every purchase goes directly to support Dr. Thomas Seyfried's groundbreaking research. That's why the direct ebook purchase is the best option to donate as much as possible. You can see all of the donations Mr. Rockermeyer has already made at www.ketoforcancer.net. That's right, when you buy our books, you're not just investing in your own knowledge, you're also contributing to the future of cancer research. Help us make a difference. Together, we can drive change and save lives. Right. So when we talk about fighting cancer, essentially we're talking about fighting our own body. And, and as long as you keep that body full of sugar and glutamine, uh, or uh, is, uh, uh, well, the, the, the sugar and the high, high fructose foods that we eat, I mean, you're just letting that thing go crazy. Um, so <clears throat> that's clear uh, what's happened. Now, why, why did our ancestors and some of the primitive uh, ne uh, um, aboriginal tribes have such a low level of cancer? Um, because of their environment. If you're in an environment where uh, uh, highly processed carbohydrate f uh, foods are in minimal supply <coughs> and you have a lot of exercise, we have a surveillance system in our body. And if we have a cell where the mitochondria may slowly become corrupted, um, that cell is consumed for the good of the whole. Uh, our, our macrophages come in, see that cell. It's not performing. It's not living up to the society requirements. It's eaten. <coughs> Excuse me. And, um, and then the molecules from that cell that was eaten are now distributed throughout the body for the rest of the cell. So you say, well, why? Why, why did I, cancer become uh, so prevalent uh, over the last 50 or 60? I mean, we've had cancer since, since uh, Neolithic times, but it was, it was very rare. It was extreme, extremely rare. Uh, and now it's, it's overtaking heart disease as the number one killer uh, uh, in Western societies. So um, what's going on? Um, and we're, we're allowing uh, our cells to become lazy and fat, and we're not uh, surveilling the body the way we should. It's hard to ferret out weak in, uh, cells if there's always a surfeit of carbohydrate glucose in the bloodstream because the rest of the cells become, uh, uh, they're less proficient in weeding out the weak, the lame, the unfit when everybody is fat and happy with all the sugar in our, in our, in our system. So there's no need to ferret out these dysregulated cells until, and then all of a sudden you find yourself with it spread all over your body or you're, you know, you really have a big problem. So, uh, um, and, uh, you know, you can go back and look at, you know, uh, the way, the way most organ cancer is very rare in organisms that live in their natural environments. All right. Wolves rarely had cancer. None of our, uh, very few of our primate relatives, the chimps, the gorillas, the orangutans, cancer is very rare in these, in, in, in these animal species. Just like our aboriginal past, uh, cancer is extremely rare. It's only within, uh, you know, the last, say, uh, 50 or 60 years, especially within the last 30 or 40 years, that we see this. Why is this? 
Why, what is going on? It's not genetic. This whole nonsense about cancer being genetic is crazy. Um, it's environmental. Uh, wake up, people. It's an environmental uh, situation. As soon as the Food and Drug Administration unleashed high fructose corn syrup, uh, and as soon as our uh, society became more dependent on technology, we lack our re re exercise, we're filling our bodies with um, glucose and sugar is, is not a carcinogen but it creates systemic inflammation. Systemic inflammation will damage oxidative phosphorylation. As systemic inflammation allows you to be infected by viruses, oncogenic viruses. You, your body simply become weaker uh, when you're in these kinds of, of states. As I said before, you know, we have an obesity epidemic. Um, this, pro this propels people for type 2 diabetes, dementia, Cancer, cardiovascular disease, it, it, it's all of these diseases together are called chronic diseases from our diet and lifestyle. Okay, diet and lifestyle are responsible for this problem. And, um, you know, now you try to figure out, uh, okay, what are we going to do to manage the system? Well, you could do prevention. As you know, most people don't care about prevention. Some do, most people don't. Um, and then when you have cancer. People want some sort of a, a rapid uh, cure. And you get, you know, all these toxic things that, that you're given when you do standard of care. And uh, you, you have a bad problem, you make it worse. Um, but you're right, Jesse, it's, it's ourselves. You know, um, it's our body. It's the way we, we live in our society that's contributing to a lot of this problem. There's some really interesting research with cells. And this is where they took different organelles Actually, it was the cytoplasm and the nucleus, and then they put different tumors into the cytoplasm and the nucleus. Talk about how that worked and what they found out from that. Yeah, well, well, that's the nuclear transfer experiments. I, I summarized all of those um, as I mentioned in the, in the last. Maybe I did. I don't. I don't remember. Um, but you know that that uh, those nuclear transfer experiments were um, a backbreaker to this whole view that cancer is a genetic disease. Um, you know, these, these studies were done uh, by Dr. Kim, uh, Kinnell at the, um, he was down at Louisiana. He, he since went to the Minnesota. He passed away a couple of years ago. McKinnell's work on the frogs. And, and then there was Jim Morgan's group at Ju St. Jude's. And there was uh, Rudy Anish's group down here at MIT. Uh, Beatrice Mintz's group. Um, the, uh, Israel and Schaefer's group from the University of Vermont, uh, Shay and Wimberlin from uh, uh, University of Texas. I mean, all of these groups had done these kinds of experiments where they would take the nucleus uh, uh, of a, um, a tumor cell and put it into the uh, cytoplasm. Uh, correction, they took the nucleus uh, 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 of, of a... Um, yeah, to put a nucleus of a tumor cell, put it into a normal cytoplasm, and you would get no no dysregulated growth. On the other hand, if you took the normal nucleus and put it into the tumor cytoplasm, uh, you got dysregulated growth. And I documented how these studies were done over and over again, repeated time and time again. Okay, all different types of cancers, all different types of protocols. And as I said, what were they doing? They were simply asking whether or not a, 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 a tumor nucleus could direct uh, normal development or not? And the answer was um, uh, the tumor nucleus uh, uh, was suppressed in its abnormal growth. So the cytoplasm was controlling uh, the, dis the regula The cytoplasm was controlling the regulation of growth. And that's exactly what I said, because the, in the cytoplasm are the mitochondria, and the mitochondria control the cell cycle. And if the mitochondria are damaged, it doesn't make, if the nucleus is, is so you'd have all these nu nuclear gene mutations and you put it in a normal cytoplasm and you get normal regulated growth. I, I have a picture of it around here somewhere. I should have had it, but um, the picture says a thousand words. You, you can follow the picture. I published it in this paper here. Um, the, the folks can read all of the details of these, of these, of these experiments if you go and read the detailed uh, documentation of these, with all the references, I even have it in my book. I have a whole chapter on the nuclear mitochondrial transfer experiments. Also, if you have a cell that's dysregulated in growth, and you say, "Well, well, we're going to take out the, the clean out the bad mitochondria and put new mitochondria in," 
you, the cell becomes regulated in its growth. And then if I have um, uh, a, a, a slow growing or a normal cell and I put abnormal mitochondria in there, it becomes dysregulated in its growth. So it's just yeah, everything is controlled by the mitochondria in the cytoplasm, not by the, by the genes in the nucleus. So this is the key that tells us that cancer cannot be a, gen a nuclear-driven genetic mutation disease, uh, and that is a mitochondrial metabolic disease, and that changes the whole playing field about how cancer should be treated, managed, and viewed. And once that comes around, the whole system will change to a more uh, rational way to treat this without toxicity. So until that becomes more widely known, we're going to suffer through, through uh, what we're pr currently having. And where this can become confusing for people is the fact that with the new theory you're proposing, there still is genetic changes as cancer develops. The difference is with the conventional wisdom and, and theory, they're saying the cause of cancer is genetic. In your case, you're just saying that genetic changes happen as cancer develops. Yeah. I mean, they come down. So with the cancer cells are throwing out what we call reactive oxygen species. So if the mitochondria are abnormal, oxygen comes in, and instead of serving as an acceptor for electrons to generate ATP, they form these ROS, reactive oxygen species, which are like me metabolic bombs. They destroy the proteins. They destroy the DNA. They cause mutations in the DNA. They cause abnormalities in the lipids. And they kind of just destroy, disrupt everything, right? So the ROS, so the mitochondria become damaged. They produce ROS. ROS are carcinogenic and mutagenic. What does that mean? It means that the, the, the abnormal, abnormal uh, metabolites, uh, these ROS coming out of the mi mitochondria, are causing the mutations as downstream effects in the nucleus. As downstream. So yes, when you look under uh, big gene sequencings like they do down here at the Broad Center or wherever these big gene sequencing, they find thousands and millions of genetic defects in the nucleus of tumor cells. And precision medicine says we need to focus on those unique kinds of mutations to try to manage cancer. That's crazy. They're all downstream stuff. Um, and you can see why we have 1,600 people a day. They're not dying from cancer because these therapies, precision medicine, all this kind of stuff you hear about, it's not working because it's based on a flawed theory. And in this paper here, uh, Dr. Christos Chinopoulos, world leader in mitochondrial energy metabolism and I, uh, compared and contrast the view of cancer as a genetic disease or cancer as a mitochondrial metabolic disease. And it becomes clear to everyone with a reasonable level of education and functional brain cells that, that uh, cancer cannot be a genetic disease, period. Okay? Uh, period. It's not a genetic disease. Yet, People would say, how is it possible you can say that when I go down to all the top cancer centers and they're all telling me that it's because they don't read the scientific literature, either they don't read it or they don't understand it or they don't want to know about it. So what am I supposed to do about that? I mean, you're, I'm telling you what's going on. People can listen. They can make up their own minds. They can read the papers themselves and come to their own conclusion. The beautiful thing about your theory, and we're going to get to treatment here, the beautiful thing about that as well is the fact that this is very non-toxic and it applies to cancers across the board. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's really important, Jesse, because, you know, and that's another thing that hold, is holding us back massively, um, that you have, you think brain cancer is different from breast cancer, different from lung cancer, different from colon cancer, different from bladder cancer, different from melanoma uh, different from leukemias, different for, different from all these. I have a leukemia, set, breast cancer. They're all the, they're all very very similar. I did I showed all that evidence. We went back and looked at every one of the major cancers, and they all have defects in the number structure and function of their mitochondria. That means every one of these major cancers is dependent on glucose and glutamine, right? I mean, this is scary. It's very scary. You're telling me that all these cancers, yeah, unite the tribes. Bring all these breast cancer, bring all the colon, the brain, bring them all together in one table and sit around and saying, what do we all have in common, folks? You know, okay, you think your brain cancer is different from my breast cancer, from my colon cancer? They're all fermenters. They all have damaged respiration and they're all fermenting. So are you telling me a similar kind of therapy could be effective in managing all these kinds of cancers? And the answer is absolutely. How do you know? Because I've done it. I've tested it in the lab. We can't find any cancer that can live without glucose and glutamine. So what, is it, what does that say? 
I mean, it's not like, oh, they're so sophisticated. They're so tough. Oh, they're so wily. That's all bullshit. You know, they're just not reading the literature on what you should know to know about the biology of the cell. Um, so, yeah, is anyone, is there, are there any therapies anywhere in any major clinic on the planet that is reducing uh, glucose and glutamine while transitioning the body over to ketones because ketones cannot be fermented? Uh, and the answer is no. It's not being done anywhere. Are there clinical trials thinking about this? Yes. What does that mean? Well, we're going to use standard of care and then maybe throw in some sort of a diet. Um, that's going to have a minor effect. You got to do what I say. You have to do the way we're working and we're developing the, the, the global therapy for cancer because we understand the biology of the problem. We know how to tackle this. Will, will it be successful on every human being that would come in that would have cancer? Probably not. But I can tell you, it's going to do a hell of a lot better than everything that we have currently uh, as a standard of care. And I know this because I've tested it. I've been spending many, many years uh, looking at these kinds of things. And we're shocked by the fact that it cannot be adapted in clinics. And I, that's, why well, you figure it out? Why you ask the people, what's going on here? Why, why is this not being done? Well, we went deep into treatment last time, and we've been dancing around it this conversation as well. I think before we proceed, it's important we we cover off what that is. And you've talked about the glutamine and the glucose. So let's just, and again, this comes back to the fact that all cancers are treated the same under this theory. So it doesn't matter what kind of cancer example we use here. Let's just call it cancer. So somebody has cancer and they want to take on this quote unquote alternative treatment. How do and they I, begin? I, I saw, you're hundred percent right. I saw a lot of the comments say, oh, he talks about this, but where do you go? Yes. Where do you go? And you know where they go? They go to Dana-Farber, MD Anderson, and Sloan Kettering, and Moffitt Cancer Center, Fred Hutch Cancer Center, and all these different, the, the James, you name it. They go there, and they say, I want metabolic. Oh, there's no, no evidence to support metabolic therapy. So where are, the, where are these poor folks going to go? I mean, they should be banging the doors down in their hospital and say, I want metabolic therapy. Uh, and then they get, they get belittled and, 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 and uh, ridiculed, uh, and, they, and they, they get a blind, sh a cold shoulder. I mean, this is nuts. Uh, why are they doing it? And they're all, you know, they, I, I agree with many of the comments. They're saying, oh, Seafree talks about this, but where do we go? All right, why don't you try going down to your net local cancer center and see what they say? And they're, they're going to tell you, what I'm saying makes, oh, I never heard of this. Uh, he, he doesn't know. He's not this. He's not that. But, and I so, said, well, I don't, I, I, those kinds of comments are superficial. You tell me what part of the scientific research that I have done that, that you find uh, is, 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 is not supported. Okay, you show me the evidence that what I'm saying is wrong. You show me a cancer cell that can live comfortably without glucose and glutamine. Then maybe I'll say, I really want to know about that because I've been looking for that for 40 years and I haven't found it. I want to know about that. So, um, yeah, so, you, you know, you can't, oh, there's no clinical, I, you can't do what Seafried says because there's no clinical trials. Well, what the hell? Well, why don't you do a clinical trial? And they're, well, we can't do it. <laughs> you can't do the clinical trial. <laughs> Why not? Well, uh, blah, blah. We, 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 you know, it costs money to do these clinical trials. Who's going to pay for this clinical trial? And then they say, if we do a clinical trial, we have to do for standard of care first. We need to, you know, we need to poison and irradiate you. And then maybe we'll consider metabolic therapy. No, 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 no. You consider metabolic therapy first. If it doesn't work, you can always go back and do the crazy stuff that you do. So, um, but, you know, and I feel for the people. You know, I feel I feel bad about this whole thing myself. I feel bad because because I understand the biology of cancer. We have a pretty clear idea of how it works. We have case reports showing that these things work, okay? And that why is nobody doing it? Where are the clinics that should be doing this? Why doesn't Dana Farber step up? Why doesn't MD Anderson step up? Why why don't these big hospitals that st should step up? OK, because they're all chasing genes. They're all looking at gene mutations that are largely irrelevant to the cancer. Right. So they go, oh, you got the, the BRCA1 mutation. You got the uh, FDF, insulin, epidermal growth factor mutation. You got P53 mutation. You got who cares? The bottom line is that they're using glucose and glutamine to stay alive. Why don't you go after the glucose and glutamine? The, the, most of the mutations are largely irrelevant. So you're taking biopsies of people, getting useless information, and then we'll go about treating them with stuff that largely doesn't work for, for many, many people and charging them a fortune for it. 
okay, which is outrageous. You know, you're charging. I mean, this is another outrage, this financial toxicity stuff. I mean, we published the paper on it is criminal. It is immoral to to do that to people. I mean, if you're treating them with something and they and they get sick and they die, and then you charge them all this extra money for this, this is immoral. This is a moral issue here. You know, uh, don't get me started. You know, I have to deal with this stuff all the time. It's unbelievable. You know, and all I do is I make sure that the research that we publish is accurate. And then they say, oh, you know, uh, yeah, we got some. We, we've worked very, very hard on doing and setting up these kinds of experiments so that we can get accurate results. And then when we put them into the clinic, like the, those few, uh, uh, those few MDs and clinics that are willing to try to do this, uh, they get really good results. Is everybody a cured or is everybody? No. How many, how, is everybody cured and managed using toxic radiation and chemo? I mean, give me a break. Uh, but we generally see a better quality of life, uh, overall survival is improved and quality of life is improved. Um, is there resolution? I, I don't know. Uh, how do we know resolution? I told you, Jesse, right? Uh, if you die like at 95 years old and you had colon cancer when you were 30 and you died from a heart attack and the colon cancer never came back, I would say that guy was probably cured. But uh, in the meantime, uh, how many good years can we get out of somebody who was, in fact, diagnosed with a, 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 a an aggressive kind of metastatic cancer? And I think that's the success rate. If you can double overall survival relative to the what's being done today, then I consider that success. Would you consider that success? Yes. All right. Well, there there it is. Right. So um, so you have to then try to figure out. Well, you should get guests on here on your podcast and ask them those kinds of questions. Why are you guys not using metabolic therapy? Right. And see what kind of answers you get. It's very interesting. Instead of having me on here, why don't you go out and get some of the guys running the, the big uh, cancer clinic? Go get the head of cancer uh, biology down here, Dana Farber, MD, uh, get those guys in here. And oh, well, we did research and we didn't support what Seafried said. Oh, yeah. Well, where is it? Publish it. Show me. You know, for clearly what you're doing is not working. So, uh, you know, you have to uh, you have to kind of uh, rake it up here a little bit and see what's going on. Well, I can see and hear your passion and well, I feel the same and I feel for people. And here's the thing. I know. I where, feel for them too. You can understand how you mentioned the comments, how somebody coming across this information, hearing us talk, they feel that little bit of hope and see that there is something out there that could be a benefit. And then there's this extra layer of, the fact that they can't even try it. Yeah. So it's like, they're, they're, it's almost like, not worse, but there's this extra layer of insult because yeah. they know there is something and they don't even have access to it. Well, I, you know, the, that's the patient. Yes, they know there's something else that could help them. And they go to their professionals and the professionals say, no, that does not exist. Or if it were important, I would have known about it. Or you, you get a whole slug of, of different kinds of, uh, of responses. And then, and then you heard some of the comments. The patients went in and asked the physicians. They said, oh, no, uh, sugar. You can't take sugar away. Sugar is essential. I mean, this is nuts. I mean, these people are living in the Stone Age, for crying out loud. I mean, they have very little understanding of the very biology of the disease they're working with, whether it's the physician or the nurse. And and I think that's not entirely their fault. And you saw so many, uh, very few oncologists, any few physicians at all, get uh, treat, uh, uh, training on the power of diet and lifestyle issues to manage chronic disease. They're not, they're getting um, training that does not involve the very essence of what they need to know about how to manage cancer. Um, and don't forget, we have pop people who are told. You know, you got to stop. You you got to stop eating carbohydrates in your diet. You need to lose a lot of weight naturally to reduce your risk for diabetes, cancer, and this. And there's a lot of people who don't want to hear that either. They say, "Can you give me a pill?" Well, the pharmaceutical would be very happy to give you pills. Um, but that problem is, as you said at the beginning, it's us. Okay, it's largely us. We we can we can shoulder a lot of the bird if we put ourselves in the position to get cancer in the first place. We can also take ourselves out of that position and try to help ourselves. So metabolic therapy is 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 different than all other therapies 
because it requires a significant participation on the part of the patient. The patient, if the patient participates in the healing process, they will benefit. Okay, so it's significant. What does that mean? Well, you're going to have to radically change your diet and lifestyle in order for your body to get healthy again. Okay, and if you're not willing to participate and do that, then you are prone to have this condition persist and possibly kill you. So I think there has to be an education on the part of the patient as well as on, on the part of the on the part of the physician. Coming back to that point you made earlier about me bringing on these conventional docs and trying to discuss some of these issues we're have we're talking about today, that at this point at least isn't something I'm interested in arguing and bumping heads well, and and causing all this negativity. the The path I've chosen is to bring on people like you and bring light to these other messages. And and the fact is that this can come from the patient up. I know, unfortunately, yeah. for the people yeah. that are that are stage four right now and they don't have a lot of time, no. this isn't going to be easy for those people or, or maybe they don't have time on their side to, to yeah. act in this way. But unfortunately, with the platform I have, I think the best thing I can do is use it to bring light to this information well, and, I think, I, and for I, people to learn about it. And then, and then hopefully, you mentioned earlier, banging on the doctor's door and saying, this is what I want because- You've been trying to do it the other way, you know, bring light to this new information and and it be, and in a large sense, it's ignored. And for somebody like me, I also don't have the science background like you. So I go talking with one of these doctors. It's not like I'd have to bring you on and you'd have to get into the science and, yeah. and be able to have a knowledgeable scientific conversation. I'm the I'm the middleman who is here to extract from your brilliance. I completely understand your situation. I completely understand your response to what I said. And cancer is an extremely contentious field. It's been that way from the very beginning um, because the implications are so profound to who we are as a, 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 as a species, who we are as a person. Um, it, hits, it cuts across all of these different kinds of things. But then again, when, when folks hear what I say, they get like fired up and excited and give them hope and then when they go to their uh, clinic or their oncologist, they get dashed down. And then there's this level of frustration. And so what do you, what do, you do? I, I feel so bad. And because they say, oh, where, where's the, where are these clinics? You know where they are? They're in your local hospitals. Okay, that's where they should be. Um, why are they not the ones uh, adapting this metabolic therapy? That, I mean, you have these giant monster cancer uh, centers the MD Anderson cancer centered and we have Dana Farber Sloan Kettering i mean these are multi million dollar institutions with all of this stuff going on and when people get cancer they go there and, and they say we have immuno we have all that's all based on the concept that cancer is a genetic disease so right off the bat you know you're getting a treatment not based on the concept that cancer is a mitochondrial metabolic disease now i know a lot of folks don't know that and um and they get frustrated and i don't blame them how do you think i feel you know when i talk to those guys um and most of the time they don't want to talk they don't want to get involved they don't they don't and if they do you know there's another layer of 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 research here that you don't know about that i have to deal with and that is those guys those scientists who say otto warburg was incorrect in his assessment of cancer uh, as a metabolic disease because cancer cells are taking in oxygen just as readily as normal cells. Therefore, they, they're, they're, they're not uh, what Warburg said, dependent on fermentation, because their oxygen consumption is very similar to that of a normal cell. And what we have found in our research is the oxygen consumption in the cancer cell is not being used efficiently for the production of energy, whereas in the normal cell, it is being used. So they're assuming that oxygen consumption by itself means that the cell is getting energy from oxygen. In normal cells, that is true. In the cancer cells, that is not true, okay? And there's a huge research uh, uh, emphasis showing how cancer cells have normal oxidative phosphorylation. No, they don't. They have oxygen consumption that's not linked to efficient energy production. Now, this is a layer of depth 
that only a very few people could really dig deep into because it's the it's the foundational basis for what Otto Warburg in the 1920s and 30s said that the ability of a cancer cell to get energy is compromised uh, uh, get energy using oxygen is compromised and i keep showing you know can we cancer cells can live in hypoxia without oxygen cancer cells can live in cyanide uh cancer cells can live with uh, respiratory poisons they do fine uh normal cells are killed instantly but the cancer cell is not because it's not using oxygen for energy so oxygen consumption itself is a is kind of a um a, a giving you misinformation misdirecting you but over the last 10, 15 years, the cancer, many people do an energy metabolism in cancer. They went out and bought the Seahorse instrument. It's a, it's a very sophisticated piece of equipment that measures oxygen consumption and extracellular acidification using indirect formulas and things like this. And they have become, uh, everybody feels that if you don't, you need to do Seahorse research and all this kind of stuff. And it's giving the field massive misinformation. So, um, uh, and, and that's another thing that nobody wants to really hear about, that I went out and bought all this expensive equipment, and now you're telling me that I'm getting misinformation from it. And the answer is absolutely, because we did we did all the experiments to test all this stuff. And uh, cancer cells don't live in oxygen. They, 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 they can grow without oxygen quite fine. And uh, so that tells us they're fermenting. And that comes back to what we did. We interrogated the cancer cells different, from different types of cancers and, and just said, okay, what can you guys grow on? And we took everything away from the tumor cells, put them in nothing, in just salt water, a salt solution called buffered salt, uh, uh, phosphate buffered saline solution. And you, they're in there and they all die. Okay, great. So uh, let's, let's uh, do it again. Every cancer cell living in, no, in, in just uh, salt water, bu phosphate buffered salt dies. All right, great. Um, then we give them back uh, 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 Dubeco's essential modified medium, which has a few amino acids in there and put them in there. And they, they, uh, they live a little bit longer, but then they croak. Okay. The cancer cells are all dead in DMEM, which is kind of a cocktail of some amino acids. So they don't live in, in salt water and they don't live very long in this DMEM. Okay, great. Now we know that uh, they, they need something to live. And then we add back all the different sugars and, and amino acids, and we add everything back. And then we try to find out what they need to live. All right? So is it, every, oh, we threw cysteine, meth, more, uh, methionine, we throw all the different amino acids, you know. Um, you put in glucose, and you put in glutamine, and these things are skyrocketing. Now, they can also live on some other sugar like sorbose, but we don't have sorbose in our diet. We don't have sorbose. So nobody's going around chugging glasses of sorbose. So, uh, but cancer cells can live on that kind of a sugar as well, but we don't, we don't have that. Um, also, uh, what you find out, there are some other, like asparagine. They can, they can hang on a little bit with asparagine, but uh, they, they're mostly dependent on glucose and glutamine. So we can't find any other fuels that can replace glucose and glutamine. So people say, oh, the cancer cells can live on ketone bodies and fatty acids. Oh, yeah? Take away glucose and glutamine, put ketones and fatty acids, and they croak just as fast as they were in the salt solution. Now, if you take glucose and glutamine and add fatty acids, they can grow a little faster because fatty acids enhance the use of glucose and glutamine. So we went through all of these different conditions, stripped away everything, and just ask what these damn cells are capable of doing under, under stringent conditions. What do they need to survive? And we found out what they need to survive. They can't live without the glucose and glutamine. And these two fuels work synergistically off each other. We've got a beautiful uh, uh, paper here. It's unbelievable. We're going to be publishing this in a not-too-distant future. This is, how, this is how the two fuels are driving the beast. You know, we, we have them. They're, they're straight shots through. These two pathways feed off of each other allowing those tumor cells to survive. And um, you got to shut the two fuels down together. You take, can't take away one because they kind of hang on with the other. You hit that one and they hang on with the other. You got to hit those two fuels together and force the body into a restricted ketogenic situation because they can't burn ketones. You need a good mitochondria to burn ketones. Cancer cells cannot burn ketones. So when you hear all this crap about, oh no, cancer, some cancer cells, no, they can't. We tested them. They can't. 
You show me the evidence that a tumor cell can burn ketones in the absence of glucose and glutamine, my hat's off to you because I haven't been able to find it. So when you start to restrict everything down, you know what these cells have to have to survive. And if you know what they have to have to survive, they need energy and they need metabolites to grow. And those two fuels give the cancer cell everything that it needs. And it can't use other things in the environment. So the logical way to manage cancer is to take away the two absolutely required fuels and transition the body over to fuels that the tumor cells can't use. And you will an annihilate for the majority, majority of cancers are all suffering from the same. Can you believe this? What I just told you? Can you can you comprehend what I just said? <laughs> wow. It's I've unbelievable, looked at a lot right? of your work, so yes. It's unbelievable. And then go down go down to your local cancer clinic and explain that to them. And then you give them the paper, you say, listen, here's the evidence that I just what I just said. And they look at it, oh wow, yeah, I was really, really I'm gonna I'll I'll read this and I'll get back to you. And then they get back to you. So um not never, but you know, most of them they look at it and they, you might as well be, whoa, what is this? Oh, I, I don't know. Now, look at this guy. This is a nice paper with, with a, a, a man who had uh, metastatic lung cancer. He had radiation and chemo. Uh, he had chemo. Uh, it, it, it was in his lung, and it metastasized to his brain. And um, he went through the standard of care. The cancer continued to grow. And my good friend, Dr. Athanasis Evangelio in Greece, immediately transitioned him over to a, a, a calorie-restricted ketogenic diet. Uh, which isn't really too bad. It had lamb and olive oil and things like that. It was actually kind of a Mediterranean diet. And this guy's alive nine years later. I mean, he should have been dead nine years ago, right? So, uh, oh, well, this is only an N of one. Oh, N of one. You know, uh, what about what about Pablo? Why don't people read about these papers? Why don't you read about this guy who should have been dead eight years ago? Why is he still alive? And he's not cured, but his cancer is there, but it's managed. You know, and they, here's the papers. Everybody can go on the web, on Google, and Google these papers and read them for themselves, right? This is not hidden behind some wall of the medical school. This is out there. It's on, it's on, the, it's on the internet. So you can, people can read all these papers and then they can read them carefully and say, well, this is really interesting, um, but I don't know if I can use that. <laughs> well, I think part of the problem is, and this ties back to something I was talking about before, but to further elaborate on that is the time factor for people because people aren't digging into this knowledge base and, and learning about it before they have cancer. It's going to be people that have cancer yeah. and they're on a timeline and, and then they still have all the pressures of, you know, family life and stress oh, yeah. and, and go, go, go lifestyle and, and money. And we could go on and on. So yeah. it's like, I really feel for people when they're just looking for what they can do practically put down for them because they don't they don't have a lot of time and they're they're exhausted. Yeah. You talk about this, the fact that when people get the cancer diagnosis, their cortisol goes up. Yeah. And then they end up spiking their blood sugar, yes. which is feeding the cancer. Like yes. it's there is a lot against people. And that's why this conversation, this is why I wanted you back on again, because we just the best thing I think me and you can do is get this information out to people and try and guide well, them. And as there's clinics, give people the knowledge of where these clinics are because you know, well, I'm a middleman to help deliver the information. You're the scientist, and this is what we can do. Well, the, I think the clinics are the ones that you have in everybody's uh, major city. Those are the clinics that should be dra adapting this because, you know, and there are, but don't get me wrong, there are uh, metabolic therapy clinics that are starting. I know there's one in Switzerland, I know there might be one in Arizona, um, but they're not there yet. There's no place that you can go when people say, I, I, he talks about this, but where do we go? Um, go, go to your local uh, hospital, ask them about it. And then they say, well, I never heard of this. And, and <laughs> so it's, I feel bad for the poor patient because the patient hears what I'm saying. There's here, there is hope here. There, there is a way to manage this disease without toxicity that could be quite effective in keeping people alive a lot longer. But yet when they want a professional guidance on this, there's no, there's where, where do you go? Okay. Um, yeah, I've been able to do it on one or two, three, four, five case reports and, um, you know, the, our, our, our canine paper just came out. So, um, this one here that, that everybody has been talking about, you know, how is it possible that you could use, uh, a, a resolution of, of malignant, uh, mast canine mast cell tumor using ketogenic metabolic therapy alone, no chemicals, no radiation, nothing. And this dog is fine. And you, you can look at the pictures of the dog and you can see 
how clear, and, and that's another thing. Um, in, in these major hospitals, when you treat cancer, you like to say, oh, I looked at all the, 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 the heat maps, the, the medical, the gene readouts. I looked at the mutations and I looked at this and I looked at that. And I tried to figure out. In our case, we had nothing to study. It was gone. Resolution means no cancer. There's nothing left to study. What, what, what can you do? You, I, I, where's, where's your data to show? All I can show is the face of a dog that had a big tumor. and Now he has no tumor uh, from a radical change in diet. And I see the same thing happen in people too. Um, so a lot of it, Jesse, will fall on the shoulders of the, pa of the patient themselves. I give them information. They can read it. Is it easy? No, it's not easy. Um, but it's there. Uh, they have to spend a little time. You have to have some level of scientific literacy uh, to understand this. So it's not like going down to your local oncology center and having them do a biopsy and telling you you have this kind of a cancer, and now we're going to institute a program to manage your cancer with toxic radiation and chemicals and immunotherapies and CAR-T, you know, all this kind of stuff, and uh, or telling you uh, go home and start cutting back on your, uh, get your, get your blood sugars down, your ketones up, get yourself into a state of, in fact, that's what we, we had with the press pulse therapy, because I think people need to know uh, about that. And this is the, this is the diagram for that. And as you can see on this paper, you have the, the red guy full of cancer, He's got type 2 diabetes. He's got high blood pressure. He's got all kinds of stuff. And then slowly move him to the yellow where the cancer is, becomes less deadly, uh, less complicating. He starts to get a little bit healthier. And then we slowly degrade, as you can see, the different kinds of drugs and diets that you use. And as you said, emotional therapy uh, to reduce anxiety. All of this is part of the package for healing. So this is a strategy for healing. Uh, and as I said before, the body will heal itself if you give the body the opportunity to do this. So it's a planned strategy to manage cancer, and it will work, and it does work. The problem is it's not yet ready for prime time in any of the major medical schools. And I don't know how long that's going to take, but maybe your audience, the people that listen to this, they're the ones that will put the pressure. They're the ones that have to make the change. I can give you the directions, the protocols, and everything else, but if the hospitals aren't using them, then what do you do? The people have to demand it. The people have to want it. I want to go over some of the specifics on that last page you showed in a minute here, but first I want to talk about, I want to show some empathy for the medical doctor out there who is practicing medicine in a classic sense, because we've talked about this on our previous chat his or her hands are basically tied because they have to follow standard of care. And as a second layer onto that, if they listen to this conversation today and then go into the hospital tomorrow and start talking about some of the stuff we're talking about today, they're going to get laughed out of the room. Like, you know what I mean? Is oh. it enough for one doctor who wants to take a stand to even do anything? And this is why, again, the patients... Yeah. Have we'll see how it all plays out. Hopefully, yeah. hopefully there is an answer and it does play out in a positive way over time and hopefully sooner than later, but it might have to come from the patients because these classically trained docs, again, hands being tied and, yes. and their colleagues just aren't going to listen if they bring this up. You know, it's funny. I, I, I speak to so many physicians, uh, oncologists and whatever, and um, the ones that know that I'm right are usually the ones that have retired. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, they can't say anything when they're actually working but as soon as they retire they come to me and says you are 100 percent right man i can support everything you're saying but they can't say it when they're working for the very reasons that you just mentioned and uh and how do you change the system um this cancer system is broken it's a broken system uh, treating patients on a, a a flawed theory of what the actual disease is people are suffering and dying uh, we're using medieval kinds of approaches to manage these these people, uh, in little kids. Uh, we're working on a on a on a on a, ch on a therapy now for childhood brain cancer, that's far less toxic and more therapeutic. Again, we have a, a beautiful preclinical system um, uh, for this. We can publish it, and then you go to and try to get into the clinic for the patient, the person who has a little kid that's suffering from a brain tumor, and they won't use it. So we're going to have the same problem. Uh, up and down the path. How do how do we change that? Uh, that's right. I, we have the science. We should be in the right direction, but we're not doing it. So why are we not doing it? 
and then you have to kind of dig deeper. And a lot of it has to do um, uh, with something other than the science. You know, uh, obviously there's something else going on here. I mean, if the science tells us we should go in this direction and we have the hard preclinical evidence and case report evidence to say that we should be going in this direction and we're not going in that direction, then what? Then why are, not, why are we not going in that direction? So why are these poor folks that uh, listen to this get some level of hope and they go to their cancer clinic and they don't get anything what I'm saying and they get ridiculed and sometimes told to leave? Now, this is unacceptable. And I understand there are physicians that understand what I'm saying, and they wish they could do this, but the system does not allow them to do it. So what's the system? Who's in charge of the system? What, who is this so-called system? Okay, There's nothing being suppressed here. There's no conspiracy here. This is clearly there. Isn't there's, I mean, I'm talking, you're listening, people are listening. Well, why is this not being done? And then you have to say, there's something else going on here. There's got to be some, it's not, it's just ignored. It's not being suppressed. It's just basically, why is it ignored? Why, what, what is wrong with the science that we have shown uh, year in and year out with the success stories that we have? Well, you didn't do a big, big clinical trial. How can we not, how can we do a clinical trial when the very people that would be participatory in the trial never heard of this, know nothing about the biology, and you're treating patients with folks that really don't understand what the situation is? Who's going to pay for the clinical trial? Right. I mean, you got to think about the cost of the physician's salary, the beds in the hospital, the 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 the, uh, the tests that we do to sure ensure that something is working in the right direction. I mean, all this costs costs money. So who's going to pay for this kind of a, of a therapy? Uh, are folks that have breast cancer all going to and uh, get their money together and say, let's do a clinical trial and metabolic therapy for breast cancer? What they do is they run. Um, Susan Coleman, pink ribbon campaigns, and everybody's out there, you know, jogging, and, and they raise like millions of dollars, and then they give it to uh, Dana Farber, MD, and it's the same guys that are contributing to the problem in the first place. So, uh, so what are you going to do? Uh, I, I don't know. Maybe it's that's beyond my pay grade. So, um, but but all I can do is present the hard evidence to say that we should be doing this. And if you don't do it, then there must be some other reason for why you you, you don't want to do this. And the clinics are in the major hospitals, so don't say I want to go to a clinic that does metabolic therapy. Well, go to, go down to uh, the James uh, M D Anderson. Go down. Go to M D Anderson, and say, listen, why are you guys not doing metabolic therapy? Get the answer. To well, we can't do metabolic. It hasn't been done a clinical blah, blah. They give you all kinds of superficial things. And if they say, well, the science really hasn't been established well. Oh, yeah? Where? You show me the paper. You know, the poor, poor patient doesn't, can't deal with this kind of stuff and shouldn't have to deal with this kind of stuff. I deal with that kind of stuff. You know, but I'm, I can't. I'm not a physician. I can't treat anybody. I can't tell you what to do or what not to do. All I can do is publish my research, show that it works. Uh, I'm, oh, it doesn't work on a mouse. Uh, you know, oh, well, you know, he said, well, those mouse studies, you know, they're, they're, they're not relevant, these mouse studies. Oh, yeah, well, what about the dog? The dog responded even better than the mouse. So your dogs are irrelevant now, too? It, go, it works together on a couple of uh, 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 case reports of guys with terminal cancer. I mean, it works on them. It works on, it, it works on people and dogs better than it worked on any of our mouse models. I can tell you that. And all of our, all of our data were, were coming from a poor model of cancer and we're getting results. It works so much better in humans and dogs. Jesse, tell me, what do you think about all this? I mean, let me hear, let me hear what you say. Oh, I've been saying yeah, a lot. I know you're asking I me think very you, good. People have a pretty but good. I want to hear what you. Are you I know you are. You're, you're asking questions, but the no, question I'm, is I'm, now. I'm, I'm going to ask you my feelings too, and 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 guiding us here. But one thing I want to point out is you did drop a hint there. The fact that there are a couple of clinics, I think you mentioned one in Arizona and one in Switzerland. Well, so, that, so people can at least have a little bit of a crumb there to do some the, searching. The other thing I want to mention quickly is I've heard you talk about, and I think even early in our conversation, you quickly mentioned it, these kits that you send to people, if they reach out to you and they feel hopeless, talk about who can get one of those and what's in there? I give them because um, they email me and I, 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 I have a kit. It's, it, all it is is just, um, you know, ba basically telling people that if you can get your blood sugar down, your ketones up, uh, you have a chance to reduce the rate of growth of these tumors. 
and I, I uh, in fact, our, our press pulse concept that, uh, that was I showed you evidence for uh, the glu- the little meter, the keto mojo glucose ketone index, um, and and that's another thing too. A lot of people come to me and, and they say, um, "Oh, I take a prick, my my take a little drop of blood and I put it on the." the stick and I put it in the meter and it gives me my glucose. And then I take another drop of blood and I put it on the stick and it gives me my ketones. And I push a button and it gives me the ratio of blood sugar to blood ketones. And we've published what we think is the the zone, the therapeutic zone that slows the cancer down and gives you an opportunity to, to uh, plan out options and things. And a lot of patients or patients, a lot of people will tell me that, you know, I can't get my, my can't, I've done everything and I can't get uh, my, 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 my reading, I can't get into the zone you're telling me. And then you find out that they're also being treated with steroids and treatment, radiation and other things. And all that stuff prevents the body from getting down into these critical zones of therapeutic healing. And, um, so that's one interference and they struggle and they struggle and they do this and they do that. Most of the, the, the people that I see who can get into these zones, uh, don't have any chemo radiation. Like all the guys that uh, these folks that I'm talking about, um, they they were not hampered by toxic treatments in the body at the same time. And then people say, oh, you know, I've been eating these vegetables and I can't get my, well, stop, try something else. Um, uh, there's foods that spike blood sugar. And then there's foods that like do the same thing. I know it's very hard. Believe me, I, I'm not going out there advocating people just drink water for, you know, 14 days or 15 days. This is hard, but, but people can do it. Um, and, and as I said, I can't go out and tell people, and I felt, I can't tell them anything, but I, but I can't say, oh, the only way you're going to manage your cancer is, you know, don't eat for 30 days and just drink water. Um, but there are people that do that and they do get success, but that's not what most people want to hear. Um, you have to have a therapy guided by professionals that will allow you to f- help you get into those zones. Uh, Miriam Kalamian, she has a service. She's a, a, a diet, a diet, nutrition uh, certified person who knows and helps many, many. She wrote the many, many patients get into these zones. She wrote the book Keto for Cancer. People must um, look at what they're eating, how much they eat, the combinations, and then you'll slowly start to see getting into these zones. And then once you're in the zone, then there are uh, non-toxic drugs uh, like these parasite medications that really do a job on these cancer cells, um, but they don't work unless you're in this metabolic zone. So again, it's a it's a planned procedure. You just can't go out and take certain kinds of drugs and expect to get any. Just the diet alone will be very helpful. It's the diet with the with the specific kinds of drugs that target glucose and glutamine simultaneously. That's the key. You got to be able to get your body into a state that accepts the drugs in the right combo. And that's called, um, we're working on that, um, dosage timing and scheduling. And that's the cutting edge right now. So that's where our money comes. When we get, uh, most of our research is supported by philanthropy and private foundations, um, because they'll, they're more, uh, allowing us to do pretty much what, what we need to do to, to move the, the needle forward, move the needle on this whole thing. And we have the best people that work with me for, for years on these preclinical systems and interrogating these cells. So once, once we know and we put it, the package together, uh, we can train people to do this and help them. Um, but you know, there's a lot of variables here, Jesse. Um, and, uh, you know, which we're, we're trying to do the best we can to help, to help these people. And um, and know that we're right, and and know that this is going to help, and it does. From what I see, it, it's going to help a lot of people. But I feel frustrated in not being able to tell them go to this place. If you want to go to the clinic in Istanbul, uh, where they have had some success, success for everybody? No. Who has success for everybody? No place has success for everybody. But do we have a better outcome than some other places? Absolutely. Will the future allow people to build clinics that will treat people uh, with metabolic therapy? Uh, maybe. Uh, I think it will be very hopeful. I have, I've, I've worked with a lot of knowledgeable people that would be wonderful in treating cancer patients. We have to have, we need MDs. We need MDs that are licensed to treat people, but they need to be able to have the flexibility to do, uh, to do this. And right now, as you've clearly mentioned, they don't have the level of flexibility to integrate these 
protocols into uh, a treatment for their patients. Throughout our conversation here, we've touched on a lot of the different pieces of what your research shows would be the best treatment currently that that is supported by your paradigm. I think it'd be helpful for people with the disclaimer, it's not follow this advice and cure your cancer, but from a research perspective, as a disclaimer, what is your research showing at this point? The nuts and bolts, because there is nuance to all this and you're not going to get into all the nuance, but what is the nuts and bolts? We know ketogenic diet is a piece of it, getting into ketosis. We know uh, stopping the, the glutamine fuel is another big piece of this, but just give us within a few minutes the nuts and bolts of what the best research is currently showing. Like I said, is there any kind of a cancer out there anywhere that can survive without glucose and glutamine? Because the more you study every type of cancer and under every kind of a condition, and you can't find one that can survive on glucose and glutamine, because if you can find a tumor cell that can survive on glucose and glutamine, then we would have to reevaluate uh, some of our where we stand on this. Um, I would have to say, are there, they have a, a norm? Is it possible that a cancer cell could get energy sufficiently from oxidative phosphorylation? And then we would have to be uh, look at that more carefully. Is it, it so far? We haven't found that, and and I think um, I, as long as we can continue to interrogate cancer cells and find out what they're dependent on for viability, then it becomes a clear path on path on how to kill them um, or eliminate them uh, from the body. So uh, yes, we keep we we we're not we'd like to work now get more into the in lung cancer and breast cancer and colon cancer cells. We've done a lot of brain cancer. Uh, and we can't find any brain tumor that can survive under these conditions. But when I look at the, uh, the biology of, of colon, uh, breast, and bladder, and lung, I see the same under the microscope uh, from already ultrastructural studies done by, by pathologists. I see the same abnormalities in the number structure and function of the mitochondria in a colon, breast, and, and a bladder cancer and whatever, as I see in the brain cancer. So, so that would tell me for sure that these guys are probably going to be dependent on the same fuels as the breast tumor. So we just have to take, it, it, we have to just go through the whole list of all the major cancers and just show that they know there's no cancer that can survive. And if there is, we really, re we really want to know about it. Uh, but so far, we haven't found that. And as long as you can show that you have the same kind of a problem in all these different kinds of cancers, it's pretty heavy evidence to say we, we, need, to, we need to target those things. And that's based on the mitochondrial metabolic theory of cancer, not on the gene theory. Every one of those cancers that I mentioned, if you look at their genetic mut uh, mutations, they're all different from each other. Um, and yet the field is focusing on the unique differences in these cancers, because they come out precision medicine, your unique cancer, and all this stuff. That's the kind of buzzwords they they have a tendency to use on television when they're inter in, when they're um, trying to tell you about how wonderful their treatments are. You know, we we have something for your cancer. We specifically, if these cancers are all the same, uh, very similar, then you should have one treatment treats all. Um, very with minimal modifications for one type of cancer versus another. So if we are able to show that they're all very similar, there is no other uh, fuel that they can use, there's no other opportunity to, for them to stay alive, then the path forward becomes more and more clear. It, 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 then you know, I've shown clearly the path forward. And this can be easily ad uh, uh, adapted for the clinic, easily, very, very easily. So this is the... This is what we're doing. Uh, this is what we have to do and keep doing this and doing it until we have not a breath left in our body to say that this we cannot find any exceptions to this general rule, that they are dependent on fermentation. They get energy without oxygen. Therefore, that tells you the plan and the way to attack and destroy these cancer cells without toxicity and harm. Is it going to be easy for everybody? No. Why? Because you have to be a, a, an advocate and a participant in, the own, in your own healing process. You know, this is the thing. People have to know that if you want to get rid of your cancer, it ha a, a, the burden falls heavily upon your shoulders. Okay? So, and I have the science to say what you should do, but it's up to you to, do, to determine whether or not you want to do that. Well, even to be preventative and to live a healthy lifestyle, you have to go against the grain and do your own research these days. Um, I think it's pretty clear. I, I, I think it's pretty clear 
what's killing most Americans uh, is high, highly processed carbohydrate foods. Um, there's no question about this. Um, it, it, it's a, it's what, what what we put into our mouth uh, that's killing us. Uh, that's causing most of the chronic diseases that we have in our society comes from what we eat. Um, it's not our genes, believe me. It's our environment and what we eat. What we are putting in our mouth is ultimately causing an imbalance of the metabolic homeostasis in our body. Obesity, okay? And then, and then somebody else who may not be obese gets cancer because that person in that, in that environment, that metabolic disturbance puts him at risk uh, for this. How do, we, how do we change? A lot of people are unaware. It's unbelievable how many people do not know that obesity will, re will reduce how long they live on the planet. <laughs> they don't know that, do they? It's unbelievable how many people don't know that being fat will reduce their life, life expectancy. I'm telling you right now, being obese will reduce your life expectancy on the planet. And especially when you see little kids that are overweight. I mean, those little kids are at now a major disadvantage of having a, long, a, a, a successful longevity. Every No, not everybody, but it's certainly a, a significant number of them. And it's not just cancer. It's cardiovascular disease, dementia. Are you kidding me? So I told you the last time they had a big study on the Mediterranean diet that showed that you can significantly reduce can cancer, dementia, and um, obesity with a Mediterranean. It wasn't the Mediterranean diet. It was the consumption of foods that did not contain uh, highly, high, uh, poorly nutritious uh, processed uh, carbohydrates. That's the killer. Highly processed carbohydrates. And they taste good. And the, the problem is, I'm not advocating we get rid of that stuff. All I'm advocating is that every time that touches your lips, you put yourself at some level of risk. That's your choice, though. I mean, it's everybody's choice. We're not going to shut down all these fast food joints, and we're not going to do all this stuff. But people have to know that that stuff is putting us at risk for chronic disease. And for some people, that might impact. Many people don't care. So, I mean, what are you going to do? People don't care. Okay, well, then you don't care. Then don't, don't complain about having cancer and, and diabetes and all these other diseases. Because who did that? The pharmaceutical industry didn't do that to you. The federal government didn't do that to you. You did it to yourself. <laughs> but right? I agree with what you're saying. But the point I was trying to make was the fact that you are going against the grain when you make different choices because, you know, every corner you look, there's a fast food place oh. and processed food is everywhere in the grocery store. And and you look at even, you know, the the government uh, food guides and what, yeah. what's trickling down for people to follow when it comes to diet. You have to go against the grain and, and do your own research to live differently as as prevention or treatment we're learning yeah, today. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I mean, it's it's us, as you said from the very beginning, cancer is us. Uh, but but the, you're right. Things are made. But we're not going to go down and shut down all the fast food shops. I mean, every now and then I, I'll grab a, a burger like once every two years. And to, is it good? Oh, damn. It's unbelievably good. I mean, you ever have a Subway sandwich or one of these things? You tremble while you eat it so damn good. You know, but if you're eating them every day, it's going to kill you. You know, but every now and then it's not going to kill you. But um, I hate to be so crude like that. But, you know, the bottom line is that our society is unhealthy. Uh, we are moving into a new phase of our existence on this planet, and it's chronic disease phase. And uh, there's a lot of things. We are spending so much money on health care, all these chronic diseases, billions and billions of dollars that could be going into education, infrastructure, military. It could be going into things other than trying to take care of somebody's uh, condition. Uh, that's caused predominantly by the individual themselves. Yes, uh, if you want to call it taunting by, I mean, the, the, the aroma, you, I mean, some of these things are so, I mean, you walk by the shop and you say, oh man, I got to go in there, get a taste of that, you know, but but I think everything, people always say, oh, you should be moderate, moderate everybody. That's true. How many moderate people do you know? I mean, most people are not, are not the kind of moderate kind. Um, but these are all the kinds of issues that deviate away from what I'm saying. And what I'm saying is I do the basic research to say how we can effectively manage 
a disease that has wide implications in society and personal behavior and these kinds of things. But we have a strategy that could make things better. And then your questions are opening eyes to say why why we don't do that or, or start to initiate those kinds of approaches for management. Prevention, you know, I think most of us that know we should do and should not do, but I, I think that management is another issue. As you said, a person becomes uh, desperate. They have stage four or something, and now they don't have much time left, and they want to do something that's going to help them. And and that's where uh, our our research comes in to say there are things you can do, and it would be wonderful if you could get that done at your local hospital. And if not, you're going to have to do a lot more reading on your own to try to, to, try to do the best you can. I want to pull you back to the management piece again. And within, say, three to five sentences, zoomed out, what is currently the best treatment, given your research, look like right now? Well, as I think um, if someone were, how, would, how does one get diagnosed with cancer in the first place? You know, usually they find a lump, they find some dis- discharge bleeding, they find, they feel fatigue, they, they have different kinds of, of symptoms that are associated with with the diagnosis, uh, and they do some screening tests, and they do this and that, and they can do some blood stuff, and then they make a decision that you know, you might have, based on imaging analysis, and of ultimately a biopsy, which I'm not a big fan of, um, because because if if it really meant something big, I would I, I would support it, but you know they pretty much give you the same treatment. Uh, if it's malignant, as I always say, if it's malignant, you should never stick it. And if it's benign, why would you stick it in the first place to get some information, which now could change it to make it different than it was when you first looked at it. I'm a, I'm a fan of, of in non-invasive procedures like MRIs, CAT scans, these kinds, PET scans, these kinds of things. Okay, so you're diagnosed. Okay, what's the first step? Let's look, let's look at the individual's blood work. Oftentimes, not always, oftentimes the patient who has cancer is out of, out of balance in some of the blood markers. So you really have to do a very comprehensive analysis of the metals, the vitamins, the, the various um, lipid profiles, the vitamin profiles. You really have to look for any, any um, pathogens that might be there, like a virus. Uh, you have to look for uh, parasites. You can't believe how many people have different kinds of parasites. Uh, toxoplasmosa, the Nile, pro, uh, 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 what is it? That uh, tick, the tick-borne thing. Uh, Lyme. Lyme. A lot of people have Lyme disease, uh, which throws metabolic homeostasis out. It can if it's if, if, if effective enough. So you really have to clean up the, the, the blood work. You have to bring the patient back into some semblance of homeostatic health. Um, so you would start. Uh, probably with a zero carbohydrate diet, whether that's carnivore or plant, uh, and get your GKI down uh, as best you can after a couple of weeks. Um, you don't have to rush around. You, you can try to try to learn how to do all this. Uh, again, you have the meter. You know, you can have quantitative estimate, and then you would tell your caregiver at the time, "Okay, I'm now in a, in a therapeutic zone." And then, then me, if I were the one to have cancer. I would certainly get the um, fenbendazole, embendazole combo, which is they're in clinical trials, these kinds of drugs. They're parasite medications. Why they work, uh, we're working on that right now. They share a certain number of uh, metabolic pathways with cancer cells. Um, So they're kind of an interesting thing, very non-toxic, very cheap uh, kinds of things. And then we would go and try to get ourselves some glutamine-targeting drugs, and as I said, they're not readily available. They're being under under construction right now for some companies. Um, but none of those drugs by themselves, taken by themselves, uh, will have the power of being used together with, with the diet. Uh, it's the diet with the drug that acts synergistically because the diet is restricting the glucose and elevating ketones that the tumor cells can't use while the drugs are targeting the glutamine. Because there's, the, the, you can lower glutamine, but it's hard. It takes at least 14 days of water-only fasting to lower your blood glutamine. You're going to lower your glucose for sure, but you're not going to get, there's no diet 
uh, that will restrict glutamine. So that means you will need a drug in all likelihood. And there are drugs that are very non-toxic that can do that, but they don't work by themselves because the, t the tumor cells will be able to survive on, on the glucose. So you really have to put them to two together. And then once you're in the zone, once you're on the drug to target uh, glutamine, you can do hyperbaric oxygen. Uh, that will certainly, IV vitamin C. There are a number of other things that work synergistically with this, with this whole process. And then thereby you go through this process. And as I showed you from the press pulse, um, you start off unhealthy and you gradually move your body into a, into a better metabolic homeostasis, gradually degrading the tumor as you go. And eventually, just like that dog uh, that got rid of the mast cell tumor very, very quickly, the body will turn on the tumor and dissolve it and eat it together with the diet drug combination. So, um, and, and it's all you taking charge of your own biology and, and knowing how to do that. But we, we're in the process now of writing up a, a, a treatment protocol that if we can get it published, will serve as the blueprint, the framework by which all cancers can be, can be managed with a very comprehensive, do this first, do that second, do this third, get this measurement, look at that, don't do that until you get here, blah, 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 go right through the, the process. And the patient and the f caregiver can both look at the same data and the patient and the caregiver work together as a team to gradually eliminate the tumor. It, it, and you're right, Jesse, in today's lifestyle of running around, taking kids to daycare, running back and forth from the office in the traffic and all this kind of stuff, that also impedes to some degree getting yourself into these new states of metabolic homeostasis. So we have to try to do this in a, in a logical way because ultimately you want to survive. I can't tell you how many people have emailed me and say, you know, I want to, I want to walk my daughter down the aisle. I, I, I want to see my kids uh, graduate from high school. I, I want to see these things. And in today's hectic lifestyle, doing uh, things that may not be the right way to manage the disease, many of them will not get to see those things. But it's my, my view that we can get them all or most of those folks to see what they want to see if done the right way. How do we get it into the mainstream? Um, well, your podcast will help people. You know, what all this is doing is, is, is bringing awareness to a situation, okay? You're, you're, you're talking about another way, another strategy, radically different from what's currently being done that doesn't work for the majority or for a large number of people. And this is a, that what I'm outlining is a, is a strategy that will significantly improve overall outcome. But the obstacles and the firewalls that are in between what I'm saying and eventually having people treated the right way, as, as we've clearly shown, there are many. And how long it takes to break down those walls and those barriers will determine how fast we're going to get this whole process as a new paradigm. And everything has to be based on the underlying theory of what the disease is. I think this is another critical issue. If you look at the National Cancer Institute, uh, and I encourage everyone who's listening, just go to the National Cancer Institute website. Easy. Just Google National Cancer Institute. Cancer. Hit it up. And what you see, cancer is a genetic disease. First thing you see. Okay. So that means the, Nas the National Cancer Institute has no clue that cancer is a met mitochondrial metabolic disease. How are you going to change the paradigm if the very government structure, and it's not, they're not doing this intentionally. Um, they just never read the science. They're, they're looking in the wrong corner of the problem. So it's not, and, and, and I, I even pointed out in the paper um, how major theories have changed the way we view life because uh, you know, everybody says, oh, yeah, the sun is the center of the, of the solar system. Everybody knows that. You know, the earth revolves around the sun. But do you know, for, for many, many hundreds of years, it was considered that the earth was the center of the solar system. And the sun revolved around the, uh, the earth and all the planets revolved around the earth. And if you challenged the Catholic Church at that time, the dominant institution, uh, you were ridiculed. And in the, in the case of Bruno Giano, uh, Gidano, he was burned at the stake for challenging the concept that the uh, now everybody. But it took, 
Johannes, uh, um, it, it took uh, Copernicus, Galileo, and Kepler, these three great scientists, to finally, and what did they do? They house arrested Galileo, right? He was house arrested. The only reason they didn't burn, burn him at the stake is because he had some political connections. Poor Bruno had no polit polit political connections. So, not, so they burned Bruno, and uh, uh, they burned him upside down naked and tried to get him to recant on his. You should see the history of this. So, um, uh, um, you know, all, all of these kinds of, of things that have gone in the past have been severely ridiculed by the establishment um, before it became widely known. Uh, Louis Pasteur, that germs uh, uh, cause, cause disease. Um, you should look, he was massively ridiculed uh, for his concepts. Uh, Semmelweis, uh, who, who went crazy, uh, who showed that germs, he didn't, the germ theory didn't come out before Semmelweis. They didn't know what was going on, but they ridiculed that poor guy. Now they have a university named after him. Um, you know, the Darwin Wallace theory of evolution, for crying out loud. I mean, that, that the only reason I have made the advances in this understanding of cancer is because I have a, com a clear understanding of evolutionary biology. And without an understanding of evolution biology, none of this stuff makes any sense. Okay, you have to have those kinds of knowledge. Otherwise, nothing makes any sense. So, and people always get upset. Oh, well, evolution challenges. And that doesn't challenge anybody's religion. Evolution is only a way to characterize bio biological processes. It's not, a, it's not a religion. It's a scientific process. So you have to do all that to make changes. And um, these kinds of changes don't come easy, uh, especially with the situation we're in today. But at least we have a path. It's clear. The path should be, if you want the things to change, then it becomes organizing people, having people get rallied up. I can tell you right now, if there were a march on Washington from people of all the different types of cancers, all got together, the tribes, uh, and told the federal government, we want metabolic therapy, believe me, you would get metabolic therapy. <laughs> he talked about all the different figures there in history and the pushback they got and and the intensity of that in some cases, given your message is so 180 of the current paradigm when it comes to cancer, what kind of pushback do you get? Or given your credentials and how long you've been in this world, are you pretty immune to that? Um, no, I don't think anybody can be immune to it. The, 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 the frustration is when you see papers that are published um, that uh, say that cancer uses oxidative phosphorylation based on oxygen consumption studies. Um, a lot of times that they, they don't cite what you've already done. Uh, and you know, that gets you, everybody, you, you do a lot of work and, and then some guy comes out and says, oh, no, I did it. No, I, I we, we, we published that before you did, <laughs> but, but, um, no, I know it's a hard thing, but you know, um, it's exciting. Uh, you know, it's like, it's like a big basketball football game. The excitement is in the game. Yes, if the outcome comes out the way you'd like it to be, then you can revel in the success. But it's actually playing the game. It's actually the process of moving a field in a different direction. Yes, it's not easy. Is it frustrating? Absolutely. But um, I'm waiting for someone to present hard evidence to me showing that some kind of a cancer cell can thrive and live well in gluco without glucose and glutamine. Okay, then I would be uh, shaken, uh, or I would have to spend a lot of time trying to figure out uh, what went on with this. Why? Why did we not understand this? And so far, we have not found that. After after excruciating studies in depth, we we can't find that. So that says that perhaps we might be correct. And if we are correct, then the paradigm must change. At some point, it has to change. Otherwise, people are going to continue to suffer and die in very excruciating ways, almost medieval-like, uh, which is tragic. I, I find that to be absolutely tragic. And, um, and, and if you know you can possibly make that less stressful, less painful, more therapeutically effective, then, you, then I'm going to do whatever I can to, to see it through. I mean, what am I going to do? Go back and plant tomatoes in my garden? You know, I mean, uh, maybe, maybe so, but, but I prefer to to challenge this whole system. Prove me wrong. Come on, tell me. Why do you think I'm wrong? Come on, show me, show me the data. <laughs> well, it's obvious anybody tuning in, listening or watching this, the passion you have for this subject and, and your intensity wanting to continue to do the work you do, 
But as somebody who is in their late seventies, how much longer do you think you can do this work? Oh, well, as long as I can breathe, um, as long as I can get my ass into the lab and direct the experiments, I'll do it. Right? <laughs> I mean, uh, if I have to wheelchair my ass in here, I'll do it. Uh, the, the, I'm not going anywhere, so um, uh, I'll do it as long as I can. Let's put it that way. And uh, uh, the nice thing about the university here is that if the students enjoy the classes that you teach and you bring the students up to a new level and the current papers are, are, are you're allowing them to read and hear about the most recent research and they get excited about it. So then that's the benefit because that's my job. My job is a college professor and I bring to the students the latest research on these topics and I have them read the original papers and use their own knowledge base to compare and contrast what the paper is saying and what the, some of the research that doesn't agree with what that paper is showing so that they can see that there is a considerable amount of controversy because a lot of kids, all they do is memorize stuff out of a textbook and they think what's in that textbook is what they memorize and they have to do tests. On. And I tell them a lot of that stuff in these textbooks, they're way behind the time. They're not up to date. They're still telling you stuff that we've already disproved. And yet you're memorizing stuff from a textbook that's no longer correct. So it opens the mind of the kids and say, hey, listen, everything in the textbook may not be correct. So, um, so as long as I can continue to do that and I do it and there's most of the students really enjoy it. Um, and then I published, we've got a tremendous research staff, the best, the best. I've got the best people working with me, smart, conscientious, hardworking, and they're, uh, they're learning. And some of them are MDs and some of these guys want to go out and they want to start these clinics and they want to treat these patients because they're going to know how to do it. And they, they, they're excited about this because they know it's right. And I tell them, do an experiment to see if we're wrong. And they work really hard and they can't disprove it. So they know, damn, this has got to be, I gotta, we got to work harder on this. So um, that's where it is. And it's exciting, Jesse. Um, you know, and I'm very thankful for the philanthropy people. Uh, there are some people who feel that they want to make a stake in something big. And uh, they don't really care whether they're going to make money on it. But they just want to know they're part of a process that's starting to change the system. And when we publish papers, uh, we acknowledge in the acknowledgement section of these papers all the folks that have supported our research. And they like that. So if, if someone gives me $100,000 to do some research and I publish a paper where that money was helping us collect new data, I put the name of that person or that uh, foundation as a supporter of our work so they can hold it up to their friends and colleagues and say, I am helping this process. Look at me. I supported some of this research and they get excited about that because they're not able to go into my lab and do these kinds of experiments themselves, but they understand that the outcome of these experiments could be profound in the way we, in the way we change and help people live longer and healthier. And some folks want to be part of that. And I'm happy to have them part of that. Because I'll, my, my list of acknowledgments for success is growing, <laughs> is growing. And I'm waiting for the day that I can have a list of supporters as long as the abstract in the paper. <laughs> I just we keep our fingers crossed on that one. But it, it's going to happen. I'm not going anywhere. So, um, and we're going to do everything we can to help these folks and, 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 and just keep plugging away at it. And your podcast maybe will help her and uh, spread the word and, and uh, things, will ch things will change. Things will change. Well, I know we got to go, but we'll end on this. We're going to end on a hypothetical situation years from now after you continue to do the work you're doing with new breakthroughs. And you're retired at this point. You're planting. No, we don't your retire. Jerry. Well, no. Well, hey, no, no. hey, hey, hey. Okay. No, hypothetical no. here. I was going to say you're planting your tomato plants. You're looking back at the work you did all these years. What to you, when you get to that point, looking at all your work and what, have, what has come of it, what is success to you? Well, I, I would say success is the knowledge that we were able to keep people healthier and alive for longer than they would have been. Uh, every person that's living longer, I feel good about, okay? Uh, if I know someone had a stage four tumor or, or terminal, I hate the term, they have terminal cancer. And these guys are living like, like years longer than they were supposed to be. That's success. Success is seeing somebody alive that should have been dead. 
according to the, the system. So I consider every one of those cases is success. And that's what, that's what motivates me, to be honest with you. When I see a little kid that uh, uh, had a terrible brain tumor and he's now going to college at some point in his future, that's success. You know, um, uh, you know a, a woman who, who has three kids, single mom, and she gets a terminal cancer and, and she's like all freaked out. And now, now she's living 10 years later and she shouldn't have been. That because she did metabolic therapy, that's success. So what? What? Uh, I mean, the university. I I have, I, I do well here at the university, but I think success is seeing folks uh, enjoy their life, have an opportunity to live a little bit longer, uh, without without crippling uh, adverse effects, uh, living quality of life, overall survival quality. That's success, right? To say, oh, I can cure. I didn't say ever we can cure cancer. All I know is, can we manage it better than what we're pre pre presently doing? And the answer is, I think we can for sure. And that's success. So when that becomes standard, then what, what the hell more do you want? I mean, right, right, right. I mean, let's give, forget about the tomatoes in the garden. If I'm there, then you know we have a problem. Uh, I'm, I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> that's great to hear. Well, the work you're doing is critically important. And I'm going to continue to do what I can do to support it. And you mentioned the people in, in the papers that support yes. your work. Yes. For somebody that wants to be one of those people, let's talk about exactly what they have to do to be a supporter. Well, somebody, um, uh, they say, well, I have my own foundation. I've got people that have their own foundations. Travis Christofferson's tra Foundation for Cancer Metabolic Therapies. A lot of people like to donate uh, to his foundation that supports our work. He has a 503 uh, foundation that, that collects money specifically for our work. And we have a, a grant system through Boston College that uh, gets money from Travis's foundation. We, we have money from the uh, childhood, uh, British child, UK, um, UK foundation from England, childhood. That's a foundation. And then, and then we have people um, who, uh, um, give us money. Well, they give money either to Travis or they give money from their own foundations uh, to our work. And, and a lot of people just donate to the university. A lot of people just, there's a lot of ways that, that uh, I, I was very, I was very surprised the other day. Uh, we got a nice donation from um, the, uh, um, a penitentiary. <laughs> Can you believe this? Uh, I wasn't, uh, Folks in a in a in a in a in a penitentiary that rallied the money together uh, to support our work at Boston College. <laughs> I said, I said, uh, I said, wow, this is really exciting. So I, I said to I, I said to my my students, uh, I, I think we're going to um, acknowledge uh, that that foundation. Yeah, I'll tell you what it is. It's called the Delaware County Special Deputies Benevolent Fund. All right. So I said, wow, it wasn't for a lot of money. But I tell you, the next paper I publish, we'll use that money, and I'll put the fund on there uh, as well. Deputies from the uh, Delaware County Special Deputies Benevolent, Benevolent Fund. So it was from a jail of some sort, you know. And uh, so, okay, great. Uh, and if someone wants to, to give us more money, we'll put my. But but the issue is is that we are good to acknowledge those folks that support our research by uh, in the acknowledgement section of all of our published papers. We have who helped us, and that tells you that the money that you give me is actually going out to broadcast what we're doing to the scientific uh, community. Well, Professor Seafried, we're going to link everything up in the show notes. Round two has been a pleasure. Hopefully, over the years, you'll continue let's to hope, do the work you do. Don't, let's hope we don't need a round three. Well, uh, okay. I was, yeah, I was actually going to say. I, I, we want to take care of this in two rounds. Well, you know, we have, I think we have things taken care of to this point, but you're going to continue to do this work for years to come. And as new papers get published, new information becomes public and these clinics start to open. Hopefully yeah. we can come back on, have another conversation. Yeah, but yeah, let's, let, let's, let's come back after we have successful clinics turning out pay, people uh, that are healthy and well uh, and are living far longer than they should have and, and have them come on. And why don't we have those folks come on and tell them, I did metabolic therapy. I should have been dead. Look at me today. You know, um, I'm open to all ideas. Let's keep that in mind. Okay. Cheers to where we've come and to you know all the research you're going to do up and coming. And I just thank you for all the work you do.
Well, thank you very much. Pleasure to be here. Thanks, Jesse.